the whole not your keys, not your wallet always rings true. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of Blogcast with Simon and Will. Uh, today we are going to talk about real yield and we're also going to cover, I guess, a bit of the news about FGX going on at the moment. So Will, how are you going, mate? How are you feeling today? Uh, feeling great. Uh, I guess just looking at the market, you mentioned FTX, but uh, maybe just looking at the market in general, uh, it looks like prices have continued to stay stable, but with a slight rise. Uh, it looks like the point of control, which is where the, I suppose you could say, uh, most of the trading volume happens at, has gone up from uh, $19,100, which is where it was last week, in fact, for the last couple of months. And I was looking at it this morning, and interestingly, it's gone up to uh, some 20,000, uh, 20,100, which is kind of where we are. So it's interesting, and it looks like uh, we've consolidated, and uh, you know this might be the new floor. But uh, you know, let's let's see how it goes. Yeah, it might be the new floor, but obviously, with with the rumors about FTX and potential insolvency going on, that um, doesn't bode well for this being the floor. I mean, <laughs> FTX as, as an exchange has definitely kind of got to one of those points where it's too big to fail. Mm. Um, so I guess. What do you think people should do? And if these rumors are true and FTX is going to go insolvent, A, what do you think that will do to the market? And B, what should people do? Oh my goodness. Uh, what should people do? <laughs> Uh, you're a financial advisor, it's really hard to tell uh, from the outside of what's going on. There's so many things that could be happening in the background. It could be uh, the SEC, which happens to, uh, which has consistently happened to uh, every token, uh, pretty much every token that's been around. It's happening to uh, uh, Ripple right now. Uh, so hopefully it's just a tiny rumor that's affected FTX and hopefully it's just a little uh, like a bump in their, in, in their um, uh, it's a bump in their roadmap, or it could be something more serious. And uh, in which case, I wouldn't want to be holding uh, FTX tokens. But then uh, we don't really know what's happening. Uh, do you know what triggered this, Simon? Yeah. So basically, I mean, the, the big, I guess, waterfall moment for where the, the, the dam kind of broke was CZ from Binance tweeting out that he was selling a whole bunch of the FTT, which is FTX's token. <laughs> um and a significant amount like 580 million dollars something like that and mm -hmm. so that then obviously got the crypto twitter rumor mill really firing up and um there's questions about the insolvency levels of um you know ftx so why would binance be doing this unless they've got some kind of inside information that there's troubles there so mm -hmm. it's i guess it's a dangerous one in, in the crypto in the whole crypto market space because yeah ftx is just too big to go mm. down, it would hurt mm. the market significantly. So hopefully it is just all rumor. Hopefully just Binance were just doing a strategic sell for mm. whatever business purpose they were doing. Um, mm. I would simply say that the whole not your keys, not your wallet always rings true. That's it. Even, even if it's just a rumor, why would you risk leaving assets on FTX at the moment? Just I would personally withdraw any funds that have an FTX. Sure, it's a small amount of gas that you have to pay to keep your, your crypto safe. And mm -hmm. a couple months of time, this all blows over. Great, go back onto FTX. Happy days, everything's fine again. Um, yeah, so that let's, let's, let's hope that's all it is. Let's hope it's just rumor. Let's hope they do have it. Um, it just feels feels a little bit too much like Celsius when yep. um, you know they were saying everything's fine, nothing to see here. <laughs> all the all the all the classic you know Do Kwon quote, of steady lads. That's kind of the vibe you're getting out of FTX at the moment. They're sending those things out. Is it just jaw burning or is it fact? No one really knows. So I would just kind of play it safe personally. If I had any funds on FTX, I would withdraw them. As you say, it's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a small gas price to, to, mm. to pay to uh, keep your funds safe and see if it still blows over, because hopefully it will. Oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I mean, uh, first of all, I, I, I would never store my funds in exchange long term. So the only reason I would be holding funds in any exchange would just be for my trading. But once I'm done with trading, I definitely want to hold them in my uh, hardware wallet. And um, yeah, let's let's see what happens with FTX. Let's see what happens with their governance token. Uh, you know, best of luck to them. And uh, yeah, I uh, guess we keep our ears open and, and see what happens, wait it out. Yeah, I think the whole crypto industry wants FTX to come out squeaky clean on the other side of this because uh, we we certainly don't need another 
massive exchange going down. That would be really bad. Oh, yeah. And another thing that we haven't thought about is the knock-on effects. So there might be other products that are built on top of FTX. So FTX is not just an exchange, it's a smart contract. And there might be other uh, projects that are built on top of it. So uh, which is the biggest risk in terms of composability in that we have all of these products uh, in the blockchain just all linked together. Well, what happens if one fails? You know, smart contracts are supposed to be unstoppable, but are they really? <laughs> you know, do they need governance? So uh, let's let's see how strong FTX is, and you know, I hope it, I hope it keeps going. Yeah, me too, mate. Me too. All right, so let's move on to our topics for this podcast: real yield projects. So this is something that I'm quite interested in, and in crypto Twitter kind of picked up this term a couple months back. It's kind of died down, comes back every now and then. Um, but let me define for you and, and the viewers what a real yield protocol is. So in my mind, a real yield protocol is a protocol that already exists and is working because we've learned from the previous bull markets that, you know, a, a wish and a, and a prayer and a, and a promise to make something isn't enough anymore. Mm -hmm. We need protocols that are actually working out there. So a theme going into this next bull market is definitely going to be protocols that exist that are working. And then on top of that, not only are they working, they've got enough users that they're producing a yield. Mm -hmm. from, the la from the last bull market, we had products, projects that produced yield in their own token. So they were just issuing their own token out. And that obviously puts huge amounts of sell pressure on the token and it eventually you know, inflates the token away to, mm -hmm. to, to nothing, basically. Um, mm -hmm. Whereas real yield protocols are letting you earn in not the native token of that protocol. So you're earning in Ethereum or you're earning in a US stablecoin. So I think that has huge power in the fact that we're now owning part of the protocol in the DAO, but we're also earning feeds from the protocol in terms of ETH or USDC. Mm. What are your thoughts on that, Will? Yeah, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. It's it's about time that we have that because, uh, like you mentioned, uh, previous years, uh, tokens would appreciate by association, it's literally value by association. Wow, look how look how good the marketing is on this token. Like like look who, who, who created this token. Amazing. It must be worth a lot of money. But uh, like you mentioned, uh, tokens do need to yield. They need to be productive assets. And uh, there's there's three ways of looking at it uh, in terms of tokenomics. I think for any token to have value, it needs to be a little bit more than just a governance token because that's how projects nowadays attach value. They just go, well, this is a great project and this is the governance token. And it's great. It's, it's great for governance. But really, why do people want to govern that project? Um, so sometimes it's compelling. So take uh, projects like uh, MakerDAO, right? Uh, it's a um, it's a, a stable coin. Uh, it's a stable coin governance token. And what's interesting about it is that if you owned uh, Maker, you could vote on different aspects of the stable coin. But more importantly, more interesting, you could also vote uh, for other tokens to come in as collateral, right? So that's very interesting. If you have a project and you want it to become collateral for DAI, that immediately creates uh, stability for it. So MakerDAO is a great example for a governance token that everybody wants to hold. Uh, another one is Curve Wars as well. That's really interesting, right? Curve token, everybody wants to hold it because they can control the amount of rewards to go to their project as well. Similar to MakerDAO, very interesting. Another interesting governance token to hold is BitDAO. Um, biggest uh, DAO uh, that controls where funds go to different projects. So all of those really interesting governance tokens to hold. And you can see why value would come from that. Um, and then there's productive assets, like you mentioned, like LooksRare and GMX that have fees as well. So that's really interesting as well. And, um, and then there's economic sinks. So Ethereum is an interesting one that's an economic sink in that uh, I forget what the uh, proposal was, but I think since uh, a couple of months ago, uh, Ethereum has been turning into a uh, deflationary asset in that it's a massive thing for ETH. If you're any of these projects that are using ETH, you'll have to pay in ETH and you'll have to burn it, which means you'll have to buy ETH and burn it. So Ethereum is a massive economic sink. So uh, <clears throat> long story short, <laughs> Three major cases for uh, good tokenomics. One is an economic sink like Ethereum, two is a productive asset like LuxRare, GMX, and three is a compelling reason to hold for governance like the DAO, MakerDAO, and Curve for the Curve was. Yeah, and I think one of the ones that people can think of, like, you know, one of the biggest, obviously, DeFi plays out there is Uniswap. 
And Uniswap being the, the DAO that it is, the token is you know voting rights. But people have always said, when will Uniswap turn on you know, fees? Mm -hmm. When when can a token holder of Uni earn fees from the protocol? And the kind of reasons they don't do that to a degree is simply that their fees go to the liquidity providers. And so that's what makes Uniswap function. And so if they take some of the money away from the liquidity providers, there's less incentive for people to stay on Uni. So they're in a hard point there where they're like, well, we want to earn fees, mm -hmm. but if we take some money away from the liquidity providers, will they just move to another decentralized exchange? And so that's got an interesting one where people want to earn fees, but they're not currently. Whereas the GMX, as we were talking about there, that is a decentralized perpetual exchange so you can on a you know like a, a binance or an ftx except being decentralized on chain and leverage and so the reason mm -hmm. theirs works is that from the get-go they have mm -hmm. been giving the trading fees to same thing liquidity providers um mm -hmm. but because it, it is a leverage exchange they need liquidity in bitcoin and ethereum and stable coins that people mm -hmm use from the people there so it's the same kind of idea as you know uni would they turn fees on in that liquidity providers earn fees mm. except with um gmx what they're doing is they they created it like an index token called glp which mm -hmm. is a mixture of bitcoin ethereum i think that there is a uni in there actually surprisingly enough and there's about 50 percent stable points so you buy an index coin which goes to them which effectively is giving them Bitcoin or Ethereum to use on their leverage platform. Traders go and use it. Typically, traders lose money because um, mm -hmm. that's just what happens with trading. And the, the fees associated from those trades is, Ethereum, is is in Ethereum, and that Ethereum gets distributed to the holders. So that's the function of how that works. So they are still being a liquidity provider earns the fees from it, um, it's just in a, in a slightly different way to how you know, Uniswap does the process as well. It's got nothing to do with owning the, the Uni token. You don't have to own the, G, the GMX token to earn that yield either. Whereas mm. Looks Rare is an NFT platform. It's a it's a vampire attack on OpenSea, just like SushiSwap was a vampire attack on Uniswap. Except the difference being is that the fees that get charged for when you purchase an, an NFT, you know, that was OpenSea was taking that money. That was the fee for service looks rare decide to say well how about we take a big chunk of that money and rather than giving it to you know the owners of the open open sea it goes to owners of the looks rare token mm -hmm. and so they've got some pretty significant amounts of money coming through there as well like they're as far as volume is concerned they're way below open sea but they've got like 70 million on average you know per week of volume and of that 0.3 percent i think is the fees that they take in in ethereum so if you are a looks rare holder you are also earning those fees coming from the platform. So it's and it's significant. At the moment, I think GMX and Luxury, they're, they're both talking about something like you know 20% Ethereum yield. Um, so that's you know a lot of money. It's a lot of money in real yield. And it's the concept of a protocol that's sharing its fees with people. Um, mm. well, interesting to see how many more tokens do that going forward, how many more projects do that going forward. Um, but it certainly makes you want to invest in these things because if the project's going well, obviously the token that you hold should go up in value, but you're also earning something that's not just the token, you're earning an Ethereum. So you're still banking real mm. yield. That's that's the concept, real yield, something that's not that token. Mm. Um, and it's very interesting. And I think um, I think projects that are set up like that should do well in the coming bull market. Oh, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And I think the, the key word there is, is the coming bull market. Like you mentioned, um, uh, so Luxray is, is is probably showing a growth trajectory, but not only that, um, you know, uh, what is it called? A floating, uh, I forget how to say that, a floating <laughs> raises all boats. Anyway, um, so, so so yeah, so, so like a, a rising market and, uh, and we, we, we've known that when markets rise, there's often a massive increase in use of uh, increase in trading in NFTs. And not only that, the NFT, the size of the NFT market today is tiny compared to the size of the rest of the market. And it's been growing over the years. So obviously something like looks really looks uh, like a very compelling token to hold uh, for speculators. Uh, but I, I would definitely rather hold tokens that are productive than tokens that are just that just take their value from association. Uh, but uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely, mate. Yeah, I think that was a great take there is that tokens that provide value to the users rather than taking it from new entries, buying the token is a huge difference this time around. Cool. All right, mate. Well, I think that is all our topics for today. So thank you for your time, Will. I will catch you in the next one. Catch you later, Simon.